the beginning of one of my favorite topics um, in this class, and this is a, it's a very, very crucial ingredient to what is, uh, what's going on in particle physics, but it's also a very deep ingredient. Um, and so hopefully it's something you'll appreciate. All right, so, oh yeah, let me lose this. All right, so often in physics and in math, we define things in, in concrete and intuitive ways, okay? So, <laughs> I'll wait till you start talking to someone, Sam. <laughs> it's fine. Um, but sometimes we need uh, a more abstract definition of something in order to get more out of it. Okay, so there's abstract definitions and there's concrete physical definitions. Usually in physics, we go along the concrete physical definition route until digging deep, we find, no, that, that definition's not gonna work. We need something more abstract. So just to give you a, a very, very elementary example of this, imagine um, trigonometric functions. So trigonometric functions, sine theta, cosine theta, et cetera, Let's take a moment and identify how we go about defining those. PJ, yeah. how do we define cosine theta? Uh, as the length of the adjacent leg over the hypotenuse. Exactly, we take a right triangle. So we just, we can actually build one. We can literally build one. So if, you, if I ask you what is the cosine of that angle theta, you build a right triangle where this is one of its interior angles, and then you measure the length of this, and you measure the length of this, and then the cosine theta is just the ratio of those two lengths. It's a very, very crisply defined thing, right? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. That is a concrete definition. You build it. build a right triangle. One of his interior angles is I theta. Go ahead, build one. Anybody gonna do it? Take his paper, fold it into a right triangle with an interior angle that's I times theta. Do it. Somebody show me. Can't do it. No, clearly this concrete, <laughs> I don't know why my triangle's got a little uh, ear there, but uh, anyway, uh, clearly, <laughs> geez, uh, clearly this very, very concrete intuitive definition of trigonometric functions is going to fail the minute we try and extend it to imaginary angles. Well, let's just say these don't exist. How's that? No, that's not gonna be any good, because those do exist, right? So how can we define a cosine to accommodate an imaginary angle? We can define it that way, but I'm going to go another route. That's a, that's a perfectly fine way to do it. Yeah? Uh, the x projection of the unit circle. The x projection of the unit circle. Sure. How are you going to get the i in there? I have a plane to be 0 for an imaginary angle. That will work as well. You have another suggestion? Uh, yeah, so th these are all good routes to do it. I'll just go with the Taylor series for simplicity. So we know that we can do the we can do the Taylor series, and the first few terms are as such. Okay, and what's nice about this is that we can immediately generalize this to cosine i theta, right? We just replace theta everywhere with i theta, and we're done. And all of these things are perfectly well defined. Okay? 
then we can take this definition, if you will, and, and calling this the definition of cosine theta is not really important. I mean, mathematicians might have a deep abstract definition, but I'm just trying to point out that if you're willing to get away from triangles, but a concrete, and go to something more abstract, you can do more. You can get, for example, trigonometric functions whose arguments are imaginary angles. And then you start seeing interesting connections. So for example, cosh theta, which is how this is uh, often labeled, ends up being e to the theta minus e plus e to the minus theta over two, okay? Which of course is cosine i theta, all right? So you get this whole nice interplay between uh, hyperbolic trigonometric functions, the exponential maps, and then just trigonometric functions with imaginary angles, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some of the physics ingredients and we're going to define them more abstractly than what we're used to. Any questions about this before I move on? Okay. So, for our discussion of rotations and Lorentz transformations, those all relied very heavily on physical things. In, in fact, what rotations and Lorentz transformations are technically defined as is coordinate transformations. Right? You set up a set of coordinates and then you do a transformation. Is that snow in your hair? No. Oh, okay, cool. Anyway. <laughs> See, we can set up a three-dimensional XYZ coordinate system and then we can rotate it. We can extend that to four dimensions, include time, and then we can rotate the spatial dimensions or we can do boosts and we can transform the time into spatial positions as well. So we're gonna get Lorentz group out of that. Okay. In fact, the way that we define the Lorentz transformations is we said let's take a coordinate differential and let's transform it. Okay, and of course the transformation goes as such. But remember what this is. This is just a set of coordinate differentials. These are distances. These are lengths. That's physical. So that's how we define these transformations, or that's how we have defined them. We're going to find it useful to define them in a more abstract manner. And when we do that, we'll be able to discover new and way weirder things than physical distances. Okay. Now from this basic starting point, we were able to build a lot of interesting stuff. I don't want you to think this was a super boring game because we built scalars, dual vectors, tensors, etc. Okay? Of course we're starting with a vector. So we could get a lot out of this, but is there more? And the answer to that question is yes. Now, um, one of the key things that we're going to have to be able to do to pursue this is we're going to have to be able to compare two groups and ask, are they the same? Now remember, I've already sort of talked about this, at least I think I have, and that is if we have finite or discrete groups, finite discrete groups actually, uh, say I'm doing even and odd under addition, so even, odd, odd, even. And then I also have the two element group consisting of plus one, minus one under multiplication, and this is plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. And so for a <laughs> finite discrete group, you can simply compare the multiplication tables. If the multiplication tables are identical, then we say these groups are isomorphic. Okay? However, none of the groups that we're working with in this class are discrete and finite. They're all continuous. So asking the question, are two continuous groups equivalent or not, is way harder than what you can do for finite discrete groups because you can't construct the multiplication table of a continuous group. How many elements does it have? 
an infinite number because it's continuous, okay? So, what we do know is that the continuous groups that we've been working with can somehow be distilled down to a few sort of basic transformations from which we can build arbitrary things. So for example, the 3D rotation group, you know, if, if, you, if you think about it, if you have a rotation in the XY plane, a rotation in the YZ plane, and a rotation in the ZX plane, from that you can build anything. Okay, so there's sort of these, there's this way of taking an infinite number of transformations and really sort of building them or basing them on like these three ideas. There's some independence in these three ideas. And once you have these ideas in place, you can build an arbitrary thing. This is exactly what we're gonna do in detail, okay? Now, um, let's do a quick brainstorm. Uh, what to compare to determine if two groups are the same. So, Jared. Jared. Benjamin. Oh, well, I'm going to bust through this list. Sean. Sean. What can we compare between two groups? What features of two groups might we compare? And if they're the same, then we're like, oh, they might be the same group. If they're different, they're like, no, they're different groups. Would the determinant be something like that? The determinant? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're kind of getting into matrix land, which we can do, but. What if they uh, transform the same? Well, they are transformations. Okay. So the, group, the, the groups we're talking about are sets of transformations. So if they are the same sets of transformations, then obviously they're the same group. That's, that's a given. So let me ask you, um, what about if, it's, if they're real or complex? Like if, if one group is real, the other group has to be real. Yeah? Yeah. Y'all agree? So real or complex. So let me give you another suggestion. How about uh, the dimensionality of the matrix representation? Remember, groups can be defined abstractly, and then you can give them a matrix representation, okay? Or what about the number of free parameters? That was the counting that we did for, you know, groups SO3, SO1, 3, SC2, and for um, abelian versus non -abelian. So let's just go through these and ask, are they expected to be the same or can they be different? What do you think about real or complex? Sean, I want you to go ahead and answer this one. Real or complex elements? So do you think that if I have two groups and they can be represented by matrices, if one of them has real elements, the other one has to have real elements if they're the same group? Good, not necessarily, so we're just gonna put an X on this. Uh, Sergio, what about the dimensionality of the matrices? If one group has a four-dimensional matrix representation, does the other group also have to have a four-dimensional representation? Is that defined that both groups are the same? Does that, is, is this expected is this necessarily true if the two groups are the same? Well, remember from your homework when you were doing the square? So we started with a four-dimensional representation and then in your homework you did a two-dimensional representation, then you did a one-dimensional representation, all of the same group. So no, this is not true. What about the number of free parameters? Shaley, do you think the number of free parameters, this is like, you know, eight 
for SU3, 3 for SU2, 3 for SO3, 6 for SO1, 3. Those are that counting that we did. Do you think those have to be the same? Yes. Those actually have to be the same, okay? Those are going to play a critical role, all right? And then last but not least, Sid, what about whether a group is a billion versus not a billion? Yes, it is. Good. Okay? So in trying to figure out if two groups are the same, there's no point in even asking, are they real or complex? Because you could have a real group be equal to a complex group. That's just a given. I mean, actually, you discovered that in your homework, right? Because on that rotating square, we did the four-component version. All of those were real. But in order to do the one-dimensional version, you had to use imaginary numbers. But it's the same group. Dimensionality of matrices, obviously no. Number free parameters, yeah, we'll see why in a minute. And then a billion versus not a billion, we'll see in a minute. Okay? So any questions about this before we actually get into the formalism? All right, let's do it. Let's formally define these things. Fortunately, all of the groups that we're going to work with in this class are examples of a special type of group. The comparison between is actually straightforward. And these are called Lie groups. Okay? So for example, SO1, 3. It's the set of Lorentz transformations. SU3. Strong interaction symmetry group, SU2, that's the weak interaction symmetry group, and U1, it's the electromagnetic symmetry group. All of these are examples of what are generally called Lie groups. Technically, a Lie group forms a manifold with a differentiable structure. What that essentially means is if I take the set of transformations in the group, any of these, it forms a space. Okay? Now what's the dimensionality of that space? What do you think? It's the number of free parameters. Remember, this has got six, eight, three, and one free parameters. So this group is actually going to form a six-dimensional space. This one's going to form an eight-dimensional space, three and one. What I mean by a space is, let's draw six dimensions. I'm going to start with a simple case. We go to eight if you want. No, I'm just kidding. What I mean is, if I pick a point in this space, that corresponds to an element of the group. If I pick a different point in the space, that's a different element of the group. You can move around in this space, and you'll move around in this set of transformations. These are continuously connected, just like points in the space. Okay? Does that idea make sense? We have a continuous set of transformations. We can move around continuously from different one transformation to another, a continuous path, and it actually forms a space. This is not common except for Lie groups, all right? Now the fact that these form spaces should immediately call something out to you. What is useful in a space? Describe mathematically where you are in a space, what's useful? A coordinate system. Yeah. 
And in fact, you, you pick the origin of the coordinate system somewhere, and then if you draw these things, you can kind of use that coordinate system to talk about where you are in the space. Without a coordinate system, you're kind of like, I don't know where, okay? The coordinate system is not necessary, it's just a very useful tool, all right? So, um, hang on. If we have a coordinate system, and, 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 and we know exactly how the coordinate system is around the origin, then usually we can take that as a starting point and build up points further away just by taking a little step and then just... So, so for example, let, let's look at an example. So let's talk about a rotation about the y, in the YZ plane. This is a three-dimensional rotation in the YZ plane. If I know what this looks like for a one-degree rotation, do a rotation by one degree. Then we can take this tiny little rotation and from it build any rotation in the YZ plane that is of an integer angle, right? Because I can take this and say, well, a rotation in the YZ plane By 45 degrees is what? A one degree rotation is 45 times. Sorry, say it again. A one degree rotation is 45 times. Yeah, the one degree rotation, R, Y, Z, one degree, raised to the 45th power. Okay? So if you know a small amount, you can build bigger things just by compounding them. Now, what if I gave you R, Y, Z, 20 degrees? Can you build the same? No, I mean, you can build 20, 40, 60, 80, <laughs> okay? So the smaller the transformation you're starting with, the more you can do with it. Now, this is a continuous group. So how small do you think the initial transformation needs to be? Yeah, it's gotta be a rotation by a infinitesimal angle, okay? So this process is not necessarily associated with Lie groups. However, Lie groups give you a very, very nice way to deal with this part of the story. This part of the story is kind of obvious, but this infinitesimal part, it's like, eh, how do I do an infinitesimal transformation? And then, you know, because if I want to go from an infinitesimal angle to 30, how many infinitesimals do I need to get to 30? Yeah, it's just a weird thing. No. The Lie group story comes with a solution to this. Okay, so let's see what it looks like. All right. And I want to, I want to remind you, all of the groups we're gonna be working with in this class are Lie groups. And because they're Lie groups, we're going to be able to define what we're going to do today, and then we'll continue next week. Um, and that includes finding new structures which are not obvious in their original definitions. So this Lie group idea is actually very prevalent in physics. So here we go. Um, a general element of a Lie group This is the element of the Lie group, and it can be written through what is called the exponential map. Okay? Where GA 
is a generator and VA is a parameter. <coughs> so I'm going to work in this with this in detail, but I just want to kind of go ahead and give you the idea. The generators are the things which induce tiny transformations, okay? Whereas the parameters are whatever final large-scale transformation you want. So, you know, the VA can be 30 degrees if you're doing a rotation. The GA is the technical structure which gives you an infinitesimal. And it is this map which will let you take this infinitesimal story with a finite angle and build up the actual finite form of the transformation, which is this thing A. Okay? So the generators are sort of the things which give us, I can change in this way, or I can change in this way, or I can change. In what number do you think they're associated with? If I wanted to ask, how many generators does a group have? What number do you think it's associated with? The number of free parameters. Exactly, it's the number of free parameters. So we're gonna have six generators of this, eight of this, three of that, and one of that. Okay? So let's do this. First of all, I want you to note, if A is an n by n matrix, so if this can be represented by an n by n matrix, so is the generator. We'll see why in a moment, but this thing must be a matrix of the same form or dimensionality as this one. Just the dimensionalities have to agree. And that's largely because this is a matrix this expression has to be a matrix. It's an exponential of a matrix, which is kind of a headache. But at any rate, the matrix on this side has to equal the matrix of the same dimensionality. And this is where the matrix the feature of this, that's the word I wanted, the feature of this is going to come in. So these have to agree. So those aren't indices, because if they were, then that'd be a scale. I'm about to tell you. I'm about to tell you what that is. And then... combination GA VA allows us to combine uh, transformations in different directions. So for example, if I'm doing the rotations, I can imagine that there is a generator associated with the rotation in the YZ plane, and then I can multiply it by some angle. And then I can imagine there's a generator for rotations in the ZX plane, and I can, rotate, or can multiply it by a different angle. And then I can do it the generator for rotations in the XY plane, and I can, rotate, I can multiply that by yet a different angle. So this is actually if you will, a vector of generators. So GA has as many elements as you have the number of generators, and the parameters also have the same number of elements, and you're just taking, for each generator, a parameter. So I can do a generator in the RYZ rotation plane by an angle theta, RZX by phi, RXY by psi. I can also just say, I just wanna do a rotation in the YZ plane. And I can do that by setting phi and psi to zero and just leaving theta non-zero. Okay? Or I can do all of them. It doesn't matter. So I want you to think about this for a moment. Theta, phi, and psi. These are the parameters that you can change and set to determine what transformation you want to describe. So theta can take any angle between zero and two pi, okay? 
These things, these generators, are fixed. This is just the tiny transformation, the infinitesimal version. And then you're compounding it with a finite angle. You pick the finite angles. You don't pick the generators. Okay, we'll have to talk about that in a moment. Okay. And this will let you build an arbitrary transformation. Usually we just look at simple examples. We just take a single generator. But you can always fill out this to, to create a more general transformation. Okay. Now I wanna I wanna stress to you though that this is in essence a single transformation. It's not, it doesn't have to be viewed as a product of three transformations. For example, you should know that if you take a rotation in the yz plane uh, by the angle theta uh, times a rotation in the zx plane by an angle phi times a rotation in the xy plane by the angle psi, this can be represented by the rotation in some plane by the single angle alpha. What plane that is is hard to say. <laughs> you got to figure it out. It depends on all these sizes of these angles in this particular planes, but this combination can be expressed as a single rotation. So you can take this as a single rotation. It's just usually we speak about it in the sort of basis. Okay. So now I'm going to go concretely through an example. So here we go. Consider R, Y, Z, theta. So first of all, this can be written as e to the i g r y z theta. So I'm basically just taking the first term and I'm setting all these angles to zero. And of course, this g r y z is the same dimensionality as this rotation matrix. So this is the exponential of a matrix. And that would, of course, lead you all to ask, What's that, Flournoy? Okay. And it turns out that in order to do this, we are going to expand it. So if I just expand this exponential blindly, I would say i plus i g r y z times theta minus 1 over 2 factorial g r y z squared theta squared plus 1 over 3 factorial i g r y z theta cubed plus f of x. Okay? That's just doing an ex expansion of an exponential. Now, on vectors, we know what this looks like. On vectors, we know that this is actually just 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. Okay? So we, we, we already know this. This is a rotation matrix in the yz plane by the angle theta. What we can do is we can take this it very carefully with this and hopefully get expressions for the generators. Okay? So if I want to compare this, so first of all notice in the expansion it's now obvious that the dimensionality of this matrix is the same as the dimensionality of this matrix because all I'm doing is I'm taking the matrix. I'm squaring the matrix. If you square a matrix you get the same dimension. You cube it, you get the same dimension. These i's, threes, thetas, those are all numbers. Okay? And of course, there's a n by n matrix hidden here. The identity. All right? Now, this is a sum. This is not. Yeah. What can we do with this? We can expand it. We can expand the cosine and sines in here. If we do that, we'll get the following. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 minus 1 over 2 factorial theta squared plus dot 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 minus theta plus 1 over 3 factorial theta cubed. 
cubed plus dot 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 uh, zero theta minus one over three factorial theta cubed plus dot 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 and then one minus one over two factorial theta squared stare at it. First of all, notice this thing has the identity in it. One, one, one. So this is taken care of. To get useful information, what we can do is we can take this term and ask what are the terms here that are linear in theta? Well, it's this, and it's this. So really and truthfully, by taking this thing and just looking at the linear terms in theta and comparing it to this, we can figure out what GRYZ is. Can anybody tell me? Huh? What's well, a matrix? Sam? Yes. Okay, just look at it for a moment, folks. If I take this and multiply it by i, this becomes 1, and this becomes minus 1. And then I multiply it by theta. Uh, i times minus i is 1, and i times i is minus 1. So then if I multiply it by theta, I get theta and minus theta. Ooh, minus theta and theta. Boom. Done. Okay. Now... Need to check that squared and cube term, make sure those are right. Turns out no, these are actually quite simple. G squared RYZ actually ends up being 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. You could do that in your head if you do 3 by 3 matrix multiplication in your head. I don't. I don't do 2 by 2 matrix multiplication. I don't do, I don't multiply numbers in my head. Guys, so sophisticated. What is G cubed? What's that equal to? Any takers? Well, this is acting like the identity in this quadrant. And that's the only place where this is non-trivial. This is this times this. So this is just GRYZ again. Okay. So you can take this guy and very easily find that this agrees with the quadratic terms. And you can take this guy and very easily figure out that this term gives you the cubic terms. It's not hard. questions? Good. Now, of course, you might also be interested in these generators for the other transformations, so I'll just very quickly note them. Um, GRZX kind of what you would expect. And they all satisfy that property that if you square then you get a certain kind of identity and then if you cube then you get back the original. Okay? 
Now, this means, of course, going back to this story, we can express an arbitrary rotation matrix. You can pick any angles you want. You're going to get a 3 by 3 matrix. And that 3 by 3 matrix can be expressed as e to the i I can, or with this in the exponent. Okay? It's always going to build out of the, these three generators and then whatever angles you need to put in so that the result of this is whatever rotation matrix you want. Alternatively, you can turn around and say, I want to build a rotation matrix. Give me three angles. I'm going to use these generators. Boom, I'll figure out what the matrix is. That's a lot easier than saying, here's the matrix. Find the angles that you need to put in there. That's a pain. Go for it. So if we were trying to find DA, DA for SO1, 3, mm -hmm. would there have to be like six? Would there have to be like six angles? Yeah. Okay. So this, the, those only work if we're just in the Well, I mean, if you're doing SO1 comma 3, there's basically six parameters, and the param you can define the, the generators in terms of generators of rotation and generators of boosts. So you wouldn't have six angles, you'd have three angles and then three boost parameters. But yeah. Okay? Now, um, now you might say, oh, Alex, you said these are fixed, they don't change, right? This is not a unique set. There's other sets of these three that you can use. When you pick a set, these are fixed, and then you define a rotation by picking the angles. But you can choose different generators. Why? Well, actually, I don't want to go there. <laughs> That's a more general coordinate transformation. But what can you do to this without changing the story? Yeah, you can you can do coordinate rotation. So if you do a if you take your coordinate system on which you built this whole story and you rotate it, and you want to do everything in terms of new, it's going to change these. And so you do work in the new coordinate system with a different set of these. That's fine. Now, oh wait, hold on. A Lie group is a manifold, and now we can imagine that in that manifold, these generators are basically the tiny vectors that point from the origin out. That's the generators. Okay? Let's see. So the three by three matrix. I said I could use this exponential map related to generators, and then the three by three matrix gave me three by three generators. So if I had to define the group in terms of three by three matrices, it's going to have three by three generators. Would be three by three, three by three. It doesn't have that matrix dimensionality independence that we would like to see. So what we're going to actually need is some way of specifying the group without this map. Or maybe just without using the explicit form of this map for special examples. I mean, the map is obviously useful. But what we would like to know is how can we define the group so that we can maybe find some ingredients that are not this attached to coordinates and all that crap. Because remember what I said at the beginning, we don't want to define trigonometric functions by building triangles out of wood and measuring angles. We've got to do it more abstractly. So we need a more abstract definition of this group. We don't want to define it as, here's a vector, rotate it. We want a more abstract definition. And here is the route to that.
consider the algebra of the generator. That is, if I take the commutator of two generators, which of course is a commutator, so I'll just write it down once and then never again. Okay. It turns out if I take those generators and I do GRYZ, GRZX, and then I subtract what I get if I commute them, I end up with a very nice result. I end up with I, G, R, X, Y. Okay. Now if you just look at it for a minute, notice there's Z's in both of these, and I left for the YX. Z's, YX, XY, there it is. I bet you can guess what it would be if I did XY and ZX. XY and ZX, what do you think? XY, ZX, what are you left with? Y, y Z. It turns out that, in general, if we say I, J, K, the one, two, or three, these are just X, Y, Z, but we're using numbers so we can use the summation. If I do G, I, G, J, then this ends up being I, Epsilon, I, J, K, G, K. Is everybody familiar with the levy symbol? So I'll just very quickly write down its values. Uh, I'm just going to start with 1, 2, 3. And this is the same as 3, 1, 2, which is the same as 2, 3, 1. That's plus 1. And then if I swap any 2, I get minus 1. And then if any 2 or all 3 of the indices are the same, you get 0. Sometimes they look at this with three indices and they say if you do the, the shifting, like taking the last one and putting it to the first, which is this, you keep the same sign, in this case plus. If you swap two of them, you get a minus, et cetera, so it's all the same. Okay. So let's just work it out really quickly. If, if, if one is the X, or sorry, if one is the YZ plane, so I'm calling the axis the one axis. So that's the x axis. So the yz is around the x axis. And rzx is around the y axis. So two is zx. Then what I would expect is g1, g2 is i, epsilon, one, two, k, gk. And then what's the only value of k that is going to give me a non-zero answer? Which one? Three. Three, yeah. Because if I do one, two, one, it's zero. If I do one, two, two, it's zero. One, two, three is the only one that's not zero. But this is exactly what I got here. Did I see that? Feels like it's related to cross product. It's like it's a IJ thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, don't don't go there. Don't so the epsilon, the epsilon, this anti-symmetric uh, trans, this anti-symmetric tensor is it, it can play a role in defining a cross product, but we're going to go well beyond this. So, <laughs> sorry, I gotta just say that. Um, so, so first and foremost. This guy right here is what we call the Lie algebra of the group. And this is the Lie algebra of SO3. Okay? 
It is basically whatever you get when you take the commutator of two generators. Lie algebras don't have to take exactly this form. In general, a Lie algebra will always start with the commutator of two generators, but what you get on the right-hand side is going to be a linear combination of the generators of the group like this is, but the coefficients don't have to be epsilon i, j, k. In fact, in general, we would say that a Lie algebra takes the form f, i, j, k, g, k, where these are called the structure constants. It turns out in this very simple case, in this very simple case, the structure constants are just the levees of it. That's not true in general. You'll see an example in this class of a, I mean, SU3, it's not levees of it. Okay. But in general, a Lie algebra will be the commutator of two generators and then a linear combination of generators on the right and the coefficients in that linear combination are the structure constants of the group, okay? Now, I think I can get through this slide. Okay. Now remember how I got to this. I started here. I did this, and then I compared it with this. From that, I extracted these. And then I said, wait, they satisfy this. Now I want you to do me a favor. Forget this shit. start here. Let's define our group here. This clearly has enough information to undo this story. Make sense? I mean, if I solve this, if I take this algebra and I solve it for what matrices G will do this, I'll find those same G's. And then I can take them, I can form, use the exponential map, and create a three by three transformation. So this, it's got all that information in it. Why not use this to define the group? What do you say? Yes, awesome. Turns out there is a set of solutions to this, which are only two by two. by two land is zero, one half, one half, zero. G R Z X is zero minus I over two, I over two, zero. And G R X Y is one half, zero, zero. Notice, those are two by two matrices. Notice also that's still satisfied. Moreover, that is still satisfied. Can I see that? But more importantly, these things satisfy this definition, the Lie algebra. Okay.
built this from rotations in three dimensions. So these describe rotations in two dimensions, right? Rotations in two dimensions, isomorphic to rotations in three dimensions. How many parameters are there in a rotation in two dimensions? One. You just rotate by a single angle. In three dimensions, you have three. Are they the same groups? No. So what I'm saying is these are definitely two by two. They live in a two by two, they live in a two-dimensional space, but they are not rotations in two dimensions. There's something else. They're just not rotations in two dimensions. Well, let me, uh, let me show you what the map gives for an example. First of all, this is often called one half sigma x. This is often called one half sigma y. And this is often called one half sigma z. Sigmas have a name I'll give to you if we keep in the light in a few minutes. <laughs> but I'm just going to write th things in terms of those. So R, Y, Z of the angle theta, okay, that's what we started with in this 3 by 3 notation. Now I'm just going to do the 2 by 2 version of that. Once again, you use the exponential map. I, G, R, Y, Z times theta. I'm only letting one of the angle, angular parameters be non-zero, the rest of them are zero. All right. We can expand this out with the Taylor series and then plug this into it. And then we can undo that sum in the same way that we did with the three by three case. Because after you've plugged in the generators, you realize, oh, that's just the expansion of sine, or that's the expansion of cosine. So I'll just write down sine and cosine. So if we do this, we end up with cosine theta over 2. I times sine theta over 2. I times sine theta over 2. And cosine theta over 2. So, hmm. well, wait a minute. Um, those rotations in 3D can be encapsulated in this group SO3. Three by three matrices that are orthogonal and have unit determinant, where the orthogonality condition is O transpose O, which is the identity. these elements of SO3? Well, no, because these are real. This is imaginary. This is three. This is two. <laughs> so this is not SO3. But it does have a name. Turns out these satisfy Dagger U equals the identity, and debt U equals plus one. The fact that I have a dagger here instead of just a transpose is associated with the fact that these are complex, and we have to do a complex conjugate in addition to the transpose. In two dimensions, what group does this define? SU2. So what we've just shown is that 
SO3 is pretty much the same as SU2. Well, let me ask you a question. Do these have the same number of parameters? Yes. parameters. As I told you, two equivalent groups must have. They are both non-abelian. They satisfy this algebra. This algebra is saying things don't commute. It's a non-abelian group, both of them. So the two things we said should apply if groups are the same, they apply. Now let's check the ones that don't apply. Are they the same dimensionality? Is, are both of them real? No. Okay. Does this make sense? Good. Now, I said they're kind of the same. I'd say they are exactly the same. Remember, we defined this group from this algebra, which we got from this group. But remember, this algebra is the algebra of the generators. So SO3 forms a manifold, and what we're talking about with the generators is just a little set of transformations around the origin. And what we're saying this is a Lie group as well, so its algebra is a little set of transformations around the origin. So what we're saying is in the neighborhood of the origin, these two groups are the same. However, globally, they do not have to be the same. Locally, they look identical, but globally, they do not have to. It turns out these don't look the same globally. Can anybody tell me why? Why are these globally different? Well, let's take in 3D, let's take RYZ of 2 pi. What is that? So if I do a rotation by 2 pi around any axis, but in the YZ plane, what do I get for the transformation matrix? You get the identity. Make sense? Let's do a rotation by 2 pi. What do I get? You get minus the identity. That's a global difference. I mean, this is going all the way out to the edge of where the parameters can go and you're getting the identity. Here, though, if you go all the way out to the edge, you just get minus i. In fact, you have to go even further in order to get back to i. You gotta go to four pi. Okay? So, there is a certain sense in which these two things are equivalent locally their generators are certainly defined by the same Lie algebra. So most of the group structure is the same, except there could be global differences. Okay? Now, um, OK, 
okay, wait a minute. These are rotations in three dimensions. These are also rotations in three dimensions. These we can build concretely by saying, here you go, three dimensions, buddy. Take that vector and rotate it. I think it's next door. <laughs> he just destroyed my show. <laughs> anyway, uh, or maybe I don't know. Maybe he was like, I gotta go in and see what's going on. Woo! Anyway, <laughs> okay, folks, look. These three by three matrices you can concretely define for rotations in three dimensions by taking a vector, setting it up into components with a coordinate system, and then acting on those with those three components with those three by three matrices. This is a way of working with three dimensional rotations, but it sure as hell doesn't act on vectors. What does it act on? This is where spinners are born. They are born from taking your concrete definition of a rotation and getting a more abstract version of the story and then asking, hmm, is there more? I mean, yeah, you could take this and go back to three-dimensional vectors, dual vectors, tensors, but there is a two-dimensional realization of this. These two by two matrices have to act on things with two components. Those are spinners. Okay? Any questions? How would you start from the Lie algebra and go to the eight matrix forms and two by two without just kind of writing them down? Is there a good way to do it or just so starting here yeah. and trying to realize the two by two version of it, the, the generators? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so you can, um, so how do you solve this for what are the generators? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know of the standard procedure for solving a Lie algebra. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. Um, there, there's, it's probably a simple, I mean, it might be that you just pick one which satisfies the condition that squared gives you the identity, cube gives you back what you start with, and then you can just put it in and solve for the unknowns. I mean, because it's always gonna be this, and you can say, okay, I'm gonna do G1, G2, and that's gonna be IG3, and then, you know, and you can keep doing, writing down different iterations of that, and you'll have a system of equations that's my guess, but I'm not, I'm, I haven't done it myself. If we do this Lie algebra with three by three generators, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come back exactly to this story. This is, this is where we got this from. We started with three by three matrices. We expanded them out, compared them to a rotation matrix and said, these are the three generators, three by three matrix generators. And then we said, well, what's their algebra? Now we're gonna take this as the definition because this can give you back the three by three case, but it can also give you this two by two case. Okay. Now, folks, this is wickedly amazing, but there's an important question to ask. Yes, we've got this really, really weird representation of rotations. They're called spinners. Are they important in physics? Yes, because every damn thing you're made of is a spinner. It's called a pyramid. Okay? We 
are going to continue this story next time. I'm actually going to let you go a little bit early. All right. And we're going to flesh out this spinner story in three dimensions. And then we're going to do what we have to do, which none of you have seen. We're going to continue it to four dimensions. So you're going to see spinners in four dimensions next time. Brief reminder, next time is next Tuesday. We're not meeting this Thursday. Your homework is due next Thursday, not this Thursday. And Ross is going to have office hours tomorrow in my stead. Okay? Any I'm questions? Also, I'm also having office hours tonight. So yeah. Okay. So I'll put a couple more problems on your homework tonight. And we'll do a couple more after Tuesday's lecture. But this is where it gets fun, folks. Hope you enjoy it as much as I do. I love it.